A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. God continues to shape Israel according to his mind. Having taken over rulership of Israel, he is their shepherd and is going to spend nothing to restore Israel. The Messianic restoration of Israel we read today from the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel here sees into the future and speaks to Israel in his deprivation, in his hopelessness. The word of God comes to speak to dry bones. In this passage of the dry bones, if you try to imagine it in your mind, if you try to conceptualize it, you will immediately see that there looks to be some difficulties. The bones are located in the valley. And you know what a valley is. So if you've got a mountain, and then you have a valley. So there's already a problem. How Ezekiel or anybody could have access to the valley where the bones are buried. But there is also the problem of how do you gather bones together? Who does that? What are you gathering bones for? But this is the injunction from God and the prophet is going to obey him. So God says, speaks to these bones, and the spirit will be upon it. Ezekiel did exactly as it was said. But this is not just an imagery. Like the reading helps us to understand, the dead bones is Israel. Israel was in a very difficult situation. They don't know what tomorrow has for them. But through the intervention of the spirit of God, God speaks to Israel, Israel comes back to life. And this passage reminds us of creation itself. When there was nothing, God spoke and something came to be. This was the same breath of life that Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so here, Ezekiel speaks as though God was recreating the world. The Spirit of God is made to come upon the dead bones, and they are in living. They are now back to life, and the reading ended by saying that God said, it shall be known that I, the Lord, has done this. It is the intervention of God that is able to make things that were not to be. He makes what is impossible, possible. God who creates out of nothing, can make what is not today to be tomorrow. And as this raises the hope of Israel and actualizes in them what God wants, we are reminded of life, our situation, the difficulties we face, the dry bones that we encounter. Rather than lose faith in God, we turn to God to allow him to speak to the peculiar situation that we are in. Because when God speaks, it is the creative power of the Word of God that brings into being that which is not. No wonder the Israelites are very proud, despite their unworthiness, to sing the praises of Yahweh. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love is everlasting. The everlasting love of God means that whether Israel is faithful or unfaithful, God's love is faithful. When Israel deviates, God is waiting. His love is steadfast 
it is permanent, it is ever new. And so whenever Israel comes back from his deviation, God is there waiting. And come to think of it, if God is to react like we do, in our unfaithfulness, in our ups and downs, if we are faithful, God is faithful. If we are unfaithful, if God remains unfaithful, we all be in trouble. But God allows this to be so that while we may change, while we may be unstable, he is stable. God cannot change. But we also see beyond that, that this love of God is revealed in Jesus. And then Jesus, continuing to do this work, encounters a lot of obstacles. Before this gospel test, he encountered the Sadducees. He's been able to silence them. But the Pharisees are not happy. They went for Jesus this time. And they asked him a very dicey question. And it's important to know why they're asking this question. By the time of Jesus, the Ten Commandments that we all know have been multiplied by the Pharisees. And so 613. That makes it almost impossible to keep to it. Which one do you keep? Which one do you leave? And so they came and said, Teacher, which of the commandments is even the greatest? In other words, give us a permission. Which one we shall focus more so that when we miss the others, at least we could have peace. Now Jesus surprised them by summarizing the law, the Ten Commandments. And I like the way today's test puts it, because some tests will say, the first is this, then the second. But the way it is coined here, it is first and second, but it's not really one and two. It is two in one. It is like two sides of a coin. To love God with all your heart and mind and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Since there are two sides to a coin, and you cannot separate a coin without doing damage to it, that means you cannot love God and not love your neighbor. Neither can you love your neighbor and not love God. In fact, the love of neighbor should flow from the love of God. We should love our neighbors because we love God. And if we love God, it must be manifest. And Jesus also, in this passage, summarized the Ten Commandments. The first three commandments are allegiance to God. Not to worship any strange God, not to call the name of God in vain, to keep the Sabbath day holy. The remaining seven is about our relationship with one another. To honor our parents, not to kill, not to tell lies, not to steal, not to commit adultery, to convert our neighbor's goods or property. All these are God's law and as he affects human beings. But beyond this explanation, Jesus does something radical in this test. He quotes a passage from Deuteronomy that every young Jew above 12 knows. And it is called the Shema. Behold, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is like the creed that the Jews recite every day, even more than once a day. And it's like approaching a Catholic and say, tell me what you believe in. And it starts, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That is what the Jews have been given today. In other words, Jesus has played their game according to their rule. They cannot hold him accountable. They is repeating the law of Moses, which they are already familiar with. So no Pharisee will be right to mistreat his neighbor and says, I love God. Love of God must lead to love of neighbor. That is our Christian life. Jesus invites us. He is the manifestation of the love of God. To see Jesus is to see the face of God. And to follow Jesus is to carry on the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of love. And if we love one another, then our word will be the kingdom of God on earth. If we love God, we must love our brothers and sisters. In whatever situation we find ourselves, if the love of God compels us, like Paul says, we shall be faithful disciples. As we remember Pope Pius X today, he brings to us 
the necessity of love in the heart of a leader. When he was elected Pope, there were many things that were not. Because of his love for his flock of God entrusted to him, he took on a lot of reforms that would change the face of the church for a very long time. He did a lot of reform on seminary formation, for instance, because we take it for granted that priests go to seminary. These things were not always. He did a lot of reform on that. He carried out what you call the Pontifical Biblical Institute today, where people go to study more about the scriptures. He established that. But there are two major reforms that he did that I'm very much interested in. One is liturgical, the other is canonical. Very many of us Catholics would have heard of the Code of Canon Law. Before Pope Pius X, there was no canon. You have pieces of law scattered over the place. He began what became the codification of the canons of the church. And that is why the Code of Canon Law the parent canon law is called the 1917 Code, and another name for it is called the Pio Benedictine Code. The Pio, that's Pius. He started it and died, and I'm not, a Pope Benedict, not Benedict the <laughs> A Pope Benedict came and completed it. So that's why it's called the Pio Benedictine Code. And that is the foundation for the present code we have, the 1983 Code. So he gives us a reform that guides the life of the church, that makes law reflect the love of God. The canon law is for the salvation of souls, not the damnation of souls. The second reform he did, which we should forever be thankful to him, is that until his time, we couldn't receive communion the way we do today. Many Catholics don't know that frequent communion was not common. There was a time in the church, you come to mass, only the priest shares communion. You just say amen in your mind. And then when the lay people started receiving, it was not common. It was once a while. He made frequent communion a part of the church. Today we celebrate Mass. You are even free to receive more than once a day. And then he was the one who reduced the age for reception of communion for children. Today our kids at seven, once they reach the age of reason, at ten they could receive communion. It was never so. And that is to show you how much care he has for the flock, that he wanted the mercy of Jesus, the heavenly bread, to be made available for the salvation of people. And if you know anything about this Pope, it is the motto. When he became Pope, he chose a motto, like the guiding principle behind his papacy. And he took it from a passage in St. Paul. Restorare omnia in Christo, to restore all things in Christ. What is Christianity, if not that? That everything will be restored in Jesus. And if we can apply it to our life, it means Jesus will be in the front of us, at our back, at our side. Everything we do, Jesus is the centerpiece. And you can be guaranteed that if we act that way, we will be stable. Even when we fail, since it's the centerpiece, we shall always come back to him. He never fails. So we pray at this Mass for the grace of fidelity, to make us more faithful to Jesus, to follow his word, as we approach him like dry bones, that he may speak words of the Spirit to our life, our situation, and our circumstances. And as we say amen, receiving the bread of life, Jesus himself, that our spirit shall be unliving to be alive in Jesus, to be faithful to him, to Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Let us pray for the Holy Father and the leaders in the church, the bishops, priests, and the clergy, that God Almighty, we continue to guide each and every one of them to remain faithful to the mission.